So we've been, we've been doing um, a, a, a series on stewardship, on finances, within a larger context of this year has been what we call our year of invitation. We, we, it's a, what we call a missional year, where we are being more conscious of the fact that God has sent us out. God has sent us out. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And so uh, now we're talking about finances, and later on in a couple of other series, we'll be talking about things that push us out, that let us know about the reality of us as Christians, as people who are sent out. All right. Uh, so, but now we've been talking about finances, and this is the third of four, and the last one will be next week. If you've not listened to any of the first two, please understand whatever I say today is within the context of those two. So I gladly uh, recommend that you go and listen to them on our podcast called The Gospel in Lagos. Now, do you know that um, one of the most unconscious aspects of our daily lives, you know what it is? It is we measure things. We measure things all the time. We are unconscious about it, but we are constantly measuring things. Take, for instance, now, let's say you are in the dating scene. You are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are trying to figure out, is this person the kind of person I want to date? And you get to know some things about that person. There's just some unconscious things that you are doing. So, for instance, some of us will say something like, ah, ah. I need to consider this person's age. Is this person the right age material? So you're asking, how old is the measurement? You're thinking, ah, this person, is this person going to flex a little bit, you know? So you're thinking, how much is in the person's account? And then you're asking the other question, is this person, is this, does this person want to live in a place that I think holds a bright future to us, with us. And the person has applied for their PR, and you're saying, how long? You see, how old? How much? How long? If some of us who are in fit farm, you know, fit farm um, um, lifestyle, you know, the very first thing, the way you start your day is actually, in fact, is the way you start the previous day. You set the clock to a particular time, you're already measuring time. Then by the time you get up to walk and you do how many Ks, you measure your distance, you count your steps, and then it's time to eat, you measure your calories. And then at the end of the of three months of doing that, you weigh yourself and you find out that you've lost minus 3.2 kg. <laughs> we measure life. Literally. Before my own fit farm days, I used to tell my, I was telling some of my staff members that when I was in university, my first degree at Unilag, one of the things that you know, my, prayer, my parents' prayers got me through, no doubt. It wasn't easy. The support of some of my friends, my sisters, they got me through. But one of the things that got me through was without fail, at 6 o'clock, I was at computer. And I asked that woman, five wraps of eba, five pieces of meat. Standard. You are saying, ah, that's why I'm a brilliant boy today. You are, you are, some of you, you are mising it at the time. You don't know when you should mise. Five wraps of eba, five pieces of meat. Some days where I was really vexing, it was six. You know, six. Uh, six wraps of eba, I paid for that one, but I asked for jara for meat. They do always give. You see, that's the kind of quantification and measurement that makes me happy. But when they told me how much the new printer we got for the office was, I was very, very angry. I, I'm still angry, actually. Pelumi, me, I'm still angry with you. But you see, that's, in terms of measuring things, those ones are the easier ones. There are some things we also measure that are not very easy. You see, what I've just mentioned, they are quantitative measures, so we can put numbers to them. But there are some things that are qualitative that we cannot really Measure. It's trickier. How do you measure the goodness of a person? It's hard. Or take this other one that we all do. How, uh, how fine is somebody? How beautiful is somebody? We can't really tell. Now, obviously, everybody knows that my wife is beautiful. That one is without. Who wants to object? No, please, raise up your hand. <laughs> So everyone knows, but some of you, you think your spouse is beautiful. 
some of us don't. <laughs> you see, you know, they think it's fine. You're like, okay, it depends. That's why we say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Because many times, you know, like, okay, this person is beautiful. It works for her. Who, am, who is going to complain? If I, it reminds me of um, one of my best, um, the, one of my most influential thinkers and scholars is a guy called Alhaji Mujahib Asari Dokubo. He said, <laughs> and I quote, he said, no way, way monkey, or, uh, no, he said monkey no fine, but in mama like him. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's qualitative, it's hard to measure. But let's take it one step further. There's a question that we ask normally. How do you measure a man? What is the measure of a man? If you listen to the old Greek philosopher Plato, Plato says the, the measure of a man is what he does with power. Not bad. J.K. Rowling, writer of a Harry Potter book, says, if you want to uh, know the measure of a man, see how he treats, um, see how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. Not bad. But that's speaking in general. Let's go one step even further. How do you measure a specific person? What is the measure of a specific person? Take, for instance, somebody that we all know, King David. At least most people know. David. What was the measure of David? Who was he when you think about David? A poet? A prophet? A psalmist? A politician? How many of us think about David, a planner? A planner. Let me explain. In 1 Chronicles 17, David has an encounter with God. David has said, look, I've, I've gained so much wealth, and I live in a palace. God's ark lives in a tent. I want to build a house for God. Eventually, God says, no, you've killed too many people. You won't build my house. I will give you an everlasting dynasty, but it's your son, Solomon, that will build my house. That was the temple. So after that one Chronicles 17, it's almost like there was a further illustration of the fact that he was a man of war. So from, verses, from chapter 18 to chapter 21, it tells us over and over about David's final wars, his mighty men, all of those things. But in, from chapter 22, you start to see something. David starts to prepare. He starts to plan for the building of the temple. In chapter 22, he prepares Solomon, he prepares the building materials and Solomon's officials. In chapter 23, he prepares the Levites that will serve in the temple. Chapter 24, he prepares the priests. Chapter 25, he prepares the musicians. Chapter 26, he prepares uh, 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 the gatekeepers. Chapter 27, he prepares the, uh, the army and the tribal chiefs, all for the temple. And then in chapter 28, he then recounts to all the people to understand why we're building this temple, that God has given him an everlasting covenant. David was a planner. So is that the measure of David? He was a planner? Imagine of a writer, uh, David Brooks, who writes at the New York Times, writing there for a long time, he's a fantastic thinker and writer. And David Brooks says, there are two um, virtues that, two categories of virtues that people have. Resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are the things that you put on your resume. This person, I'm brilliant, I'm intelligent. Okay, the things we lie about on our resume, right? I'm brilliant, I'm this, I'm a go-getter, I'm a uh, team player. That's the one that annoys me the most. You are, most of you are not a team player. Let's, let's. But we put all those things. Now, how would you like on your tombstone written, very good with spreadsheets? Fantastic negotiator. No. Because when we are gone, it's eulogy virtues, a kind soul. What I think is the measure of David, at least a measure of David, is not seen from chapters 22 to 28, but I think it's actually in chapter 29. Because David is going to build this temple, but it says something about David. And guess what? It doesn't just say it about David. It says it about the people that David leads. Verse 2. With my resources, I have provided for the temple. Verse 6. The leaders of the families, the office, uh, officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave toward the work 
on the temple of God. Verse 17. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. The measure of David and the measure of the people of God that David led was generosity. They were generous. It would be nice to be put on our tombstone. She was generous. And since you're, let me, um, uh, Lagos, let me tell you this. Those were the people of God in that time. We are part of the people of God now. Can it be said of us as a church, they are what? A generous church. That should be a measure of what it means to be a church. You see, the true measure of God's stewards, don't mistake what we learned last week. The true measure of God's stewards is not that we are able to create wealth through savings and investments. The true measure of God's stewards is that the savings, and, uh, the savings and investments that leads to wealth creation is not an end in itself. The wealth creation is meant to serve a larger purpose. It is meant to push us towards what? Generosity. Let me see if I can explain it better. Remember I said that we are God's temple. 1 Peter 2 verse 5 tells us that Ephesians 2 verse 20, uh, 19 to 20 tells us that we are God's temple, and yet the temple of God is still being built. We are God's temple, but it says that we are living from being built. So the mission of the church is literally not just that we are temples. We are temples, but we are temple builders. And how do we continue to build this temple? We take the message about the foremost temple to people who don't have a relationship with God and say you can now have a relationship with God through this foremost temple. Who is that temple? Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was the God-man and the meeting place between God and man should be the God-man. Amen. So we are temple builders. What were these people about to do here? They were about to what? Build a temple. And so yes, planning is important to build a temple. There are other things that are important to build a temple. But can I tell you, at the heart of it is also that we need to be a people that are generous towards giving to the building of the temple. Amen. And that's why, again, within the larger context of what we, uh, we must always set the money conversation within the larger context of what we've been talking about, we are a people that are on mission. We are building the temple of God. So I pray that at the end of this sermon, we'll be better acquainted with why we should be a generous people. I pray that somebody's mindset is going to shift today. I pray that the fact that you have opened yourself to the generosity of God, God will bless you with all of his own resources in the name of Jesus. So let us ask God for his help. That God will make us true generous to us. Father, Lord, Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, will you tabernacle with us now as we seek to hear your word? Father, let us not hear the words of men, but cause me to speak as an oracle from you and let your people's lives be changed forevermore, to which we all say, Amen. All right, so we've called this the measure of a steward. We're looking at it under three headings, the opposite of generosity, the motivators for generosity, and the power for generosity. The opposite of generosity, motivators for generosity, and the power for generosity. Look out! Sorry. Uh, some people watched. Now, uh, why did I do that? Now, some of you that watched, why did you watch? I know people are still scared. It's good. Why, why did you watch? Daniel, you watched. Yeah, you did. I caught you. Why did you watch? Yeah, because I screamed. Uh, what did I scream? But I could have screamed that you could have just kept looking at me. I pointed there. When someone says look out or someone says watch out and they point somewhere, oftentimes we are going to look. A lot of us looked in that direction. We are going to look. Why? The person is yelling at you to say, look out for something that you are unaware of until the time I told you. Amen. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus says this. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Here's one thing I know about greed. All of us know that greed exists. But here's one thing I know also about greed. All of us believe that greed exists in other people, not us. 
And so Jesus yells, literally, can you see the exclamation mark? Watch out! Watch out for greed. And to illustrate this, he tells them a parable, verse 16. He says, let's, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't tell you, so I'm going to just read it. Uh, Luke 12, verse, go to 16. No, Luke 12, 16, sorry. He told them a parable about um, a, a man who had gained so much. Sorry, I, I didn't uh, alert them. So let me just say, so a guy who had made, okay, and he told them this parable, a certain ground of a rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Somebody said, that's me. Uh, okay, uh, they don't want to claim it. All right, well, fine. The thing is passing you by. After you come and say, I should pray for you. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, thou fool. Sorry. Doubtful always sounds better. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will, you, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? 21. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now, many of us will say again, no, I'm not a greedy person. You know, I just, I'm just, you know, I, I just like nice things. But the truth is that, when we, you know, examine rich people, some of us, you know, our Instagram uh, behavior, our WhatsApp story is really, really funny, you know. We, 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 we take pictures. I, I've always often, although people don't do it again, it's a bit passive, but a few years ago, you know, somebody wants to give you a wonderful quote that's been rolling in their mind. And so they go in front of someone's G-Wagon and then give you the quote. As though the G-Wagon is going to make the quote more true or not. But what they are really trying to tell you, and now some people do that, they put a hashtag goals life goals because many times how we measure life let us be honest measuring life is oh more how can i travel oh, more nice car nice house i live in this place that is what we see as life the accumulation of a lot of wealth now of course when we now get that wealth we'll be telling people but well, you see money doesn't make you happy <laughs> to which we we'll say i won't say what i was going to say but to which we we'll say let me get the money first then let me realize that it's not making me money. It, it, that it doesn't make me happy. That money doesn't make you happy. Like, give, okay, that, that money that you have that is not making you happy. I promise you, if you give me the money, it will make me happy. So you will not be happy without the money. I will be happy with the money. How about that? But Jesus says, listen, the measure of a man does not consist in all that they have. And it's very, very true about that. The measure of a man, because many of us have seen, truly, money doesn't make you happy. You will be happy for a few months, but eventually you want more, and you want more. And that's why he concludes in verse 21. Verse 21 is so hard. He says, this is how it will be, because how is it if you have all the money and you lose your life just like that? He says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I cannot improve on how someone summarizes the statement. His name is Joshua Selman. He says, I pray that you will not have, you will not be so poor that all you have is money. Because the measure of a man does not consist in how rich he is in material possessions, but how rich he is towards God. It's a funny thing to open Luke 16, verse 11, because this is a very funny parable. You hear that, and all of a sudden, we are thinking that maybe money is evil. But actually, within the context of talking about the virtue of managing money well, the virtue of managing money well, Jesus then drops a truth bomb. He says, so if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? So he's saying handling worldly wealth is a good thing. And if you've not been trustworthy with, with someone else's property, who will give you your uh, property of your own? Then he drops the bomb. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Say it with me. You cannot serve God. You know, there's nothing else that is elevated to this deity-like status in the Bible except money. Money and God put together. Money can be a substitute God. 
But be careful again, because you notice he says you will be devoted to one. So Paul in 1 Timothy 6 says, the problem isn't money itself. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap that and into many foolish into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge uh, people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Question, do you possess money or does money possess you? Because ultimately, there are only two statements that can be true about money and possession is this, either you look at money and you say, the money that you have, you see, either you look at the money you have and say, my possession, or the money you have will look at you and say, my possession. And you know, part of the reason why greed is so elusive is because of its multifaceted nature. Notice that in, in Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus doesn't just say, watch out for greed. Look, notice what he says again. He says, be on your guard against what? All kinds of greed. There's not just one form of it. There are different forms. I want to talk about one form today. And that is, one expression of greed is called stinginess. And I can think of two kinds of stingy people. There are two types of stingy people at least. One, those who withhold and two, those who give. Those who withhold and those who give. Let's talk about those who withhold. Those who withhold are those who greed turns into hoarders. They hoard. Although they will say that they are prudential. At the heart of this kind of greed is seeing money as two kinds of idols. Security and control. Seeing money as uh, 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 two kinds of idols. Security and control. Let me explain. Exodus chapter 16 Verse 14 to 6 and 19 to 20, there's a story there. God is taking his people through the wilderness. They don't have, um, there's no uh, Buka hut there. There's no uh, mile 12 market to buy anything. How are they going to move through the wilderness surviving? So when the dew was gone, the flake, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it, is, what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather, notice this command. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. Now, stop. Before I continue. Notice, God gave them this miraculous food. It was called manna. They called it manna because they didn't know what to call it. So they didn't need to go and cook anything. God just provided for them. Now, who is providing for them? All right. So God gave them that food, and Moses says this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and then he gave them an instruction, the word. He gave them the word to obey so that they would learn that he was the source, right, of the food. Are you following me? So that man shall know that you do not live by bread alone, but you uh, be, live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the instruction was, just take enough for what you need for, for that day. Verse 19. Then Moses, 19, you have taken me to 20. Then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then Moses said to them, no one is to keep it until morning. No one is to keep it until morning. However... Some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. God gave them food in the wilderness to ensure that they understand this truth that we all try to uh, 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 put when we bless our food. Bless this food, O oh Lord, that you have provided in Jesus' name. Amen. He's trying to remind them that he is their source. But at some point, they look at this thing and say, Omo, <laughs> this thing that came today, are we sure it's going to come tomorrow? Let us take enough, let us accumulate enough so that in case God may be asleep, in case God stops to care, in case God runs out, you know, that maybe there was, there was a problem in the factory that produces manna, just in case, let us hold some for ourselves and we will be fine. Do you know the problem here? 
is as one other preacher, uh, Tony Evans, says. He says, at some point, this is what the idolatry of greed does to us. We start to see God, who is meant to be our source, we start to see God as our resource, not our source. And what idolatry does with money is that it makes you see money as a source, not the resource. Look at what David said in verse 2. With all my resources I have provided for the temple of my God. David understood that money is what? A resource. Who was his source? Verse 14. But who am I and who are these people that we should be able to give gen as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Verse 16, Lord our God, all the abundance that we have provided for the building of your temple, for your holy name, comes from your hand. And all of it belongs to you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is my source. Turn to your other neighbor and say, God is not my resource. Are we getting it? But the problem is that sometimes we actually do behave. Like, money is our source. Because whatever is your source is your security. And so some people, I'm sad to say, some people, when you're thinking about giving to the temple of God, you first have to really secure, you first, you know, I'm, uh, we had a wonderful time yesterday, but some people take the teaching of yesterday and even what I said last week, and you can invert it. It's like, oh, man, we have to be, uh, st as stewards, we have to be planners. So, you not only take for your needs, then you take for savings, then you take for savings two, then you take for investment one, investment two, investment three, then after you finish doing that, then you now say, hey, ah, church, church has been good to us. Then we now give. Because I need to secure myself. Some people who say, oh, I will start giving to church after I finish building the house that I started building. Oh, I bought a piece of land. And I'm paying for that piece of land. What are we doing? We are trying to secure our future, right? So that, ah, in old age, so that in case God will not take care of me. So you neglect the giving to the Lord's house. Am I speaking to somebody? Money is not your security. God is. For some of us, it is the exercise of control, the God-like exercise of control, where we say, eh... I will give, oh, but please, I want my money to only, only, I'm only giving to this thing. I'm only giving to this one. You say this is true. What do you people even need? Everybody is looking fresh. I'm only giving to mercy accounts. Do you give to people outside of the, you know, the poor, 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 poor. We just want to give to the poor. You control. You say, it's not just money, but it is my money. So we exercise control. But God wants us to see that this kind of stinginess stops us from being the generous stewards that he's called us to be. If this money is truly not yours, then it will show out in generosity. This sort of stinginess can be catastrophic. Let me tell you this. There are two things. The if, you see the, if you see God's blessings to you, you see it as a river, Right? If the river of God's blessing is flowing through, you, through the money that he gives to you, if it's flowing through you, if you don't allow that river to flow through you, there are two things that can happen. One, that river will dry up. And that's what Proverbs chapter 28 verse 22 tells us about stingy people. It says the stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. One day, one day, I'm telling you, it's not a curse. If you are stingy, it will dry up. And after you think that what happened was that staff of yours that spoiled that business. Or you think it was that woman that, was, that meant you. Actually, they meant you, but it was your stinginess that first got to you. Now, for some of us, it actually could even be worse. The, it, it will not even dry up. The river will not dry up. The river will, because you stopped it from flowing from you, the river will blow you up. You know what that means? You have a lot of money. And just like that fool, one day God will say, your soul is required of you. Some people have totally transformed themselves with the wealth. It's like we don't know them again. They have become less than the human that God was calling them to be just because of the wealth that they have. It blows you up so that you don't become the kind of person God has called you to be. Guys, we can do better. Amen? 
The second one is those who give. If those who withhold are those who greed has turned into hoarders, even though they will call themselves prudent, those who give are those whose greed has turned them into scammers. Although they will say that they are givers. Do you know that you can give and not be generous? These are people who give generally with one motivation and one motivation alone. What they can get back. It's exclusively transactional for them. Apparently, I'm really speaking about how we give towards the Lord's work. Open to Acts chapter 4, verse 36. I'm reading to verse 5, chapter 5, verse 4. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which meant son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put at the apostles' feet. Stop there. His name was what? His name is what? That's the, the name that his mama and his papa gave him. It was what? Joseph. But the apostles called him another name. What did they call him? Because the meaning of Barnabas is son of encouragement. The guy was an encourager. He wasn't just an encourager with his words. He was such a generous person that he was an encourager with his money. In other words, this guy had a reputation. Whenever he came, he was like, ah, son of encouragement. Barnabas is here. People just love, do you have a problem? Why don't you go and meet Barnabas? His name is Joseph, but really he is Barnabas. He had a reputation among people. He was just a man full of encouragement. He gave of all that he had. Are we following? And sometimes people look at the, the kind of clout that people have, let's say in church, and be like, ah, why is it always that person? Me too, now I can be, I'm, a, I'm an encourager. Me too, I can do something. Me too, I can give now. And some people were thinking like that. Let's for, keep going on. Five verse one. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, <laughs> It's not every marital unity that leads to flourishing. <laughs> together, because they were together. They also, notice, they also, so that's showing you that he wants you to compare. They also sold a piece of property. And then what happened? With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Anas, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Verse 4, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to God. You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Now, notice, the issue, as Peter said here, is not, the money was their own, wasn't it? The issue was not even that he kept back part of the money. The issue was they kept back part of the money but presented it in a way as though they gave all of the money. Are you seeing it? So his greed and their greed really was they were really trying to be like Barnabas. They wanted the clout of Barnabas. Their giving was actually a transaction. And so they were giving, but they were not what? Generous. It wasn't, because they weren't forced, it wasn't from their heart. What does it say about David? David in verse 3, it says David was, it was out of his devotion to God. Or in verse 9, about the leaders, it said the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and what? from their heart such that the people in verse 17 David too was rejoicing that the people themselves willingly gave sometimes some people or some of us treat giving to church or to God in a strictly transactional way it is one thing to expect reasonably expect gratitude it's another thing to give expressly for the sake of Getting gratitude. Do you know what I'm talking about? You just give somebody like, ah. It's like, did you see the money I sent to your account? Oh, I saw it. Okay. Okay. Because I was wondering if you saw the money now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Then you just say, you are welcome. You, the guy didn't say thank you. You just say, you are welcome. Oh, you never seen that before. I do it to my wife all the time. Not of, not of money, but just, ah, 
Oh, I did something. Ah, baby, <laughs> I just tell her you're welcome. You say, for what? <laughs> that thing that I did, what do you buy for what? Sometimes we, it's one thing to say, okay, I understand that if I give that God blesses us. It's another thing to give so that God is going to, you know, you say, ah, give and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together. So by the time you'll be like, okay, God, I gave. I got some money back. But this one is just good measure. If I press this one, it will remain flat. <laughs> so I need, God, where's the overrunning? So you're like, God is a, is a 10 xer Forget all these startups. That if you give to God, it's 10 x That's what you have already calculated in your mind. You are not a generous person. Do you know the worst thing about people like this? This kind of stinginess, eh? these people, if they, did, if they could find out that they won't get the thing that they really wanted, these people that we call those who give, they will immediately be become those who we told to. They, if they knew, in fact, if they could, they would even, like, oh God, you didn't, okay. I know some people that have given clothes to people, like, ah, why are you, that cloth that I gave you, do you know how much I bought it? You can't be wearing it in your household. If you don't really want it, please let me have my, my thing back. Ah, my generosity doesn't extend to that. Guy, stop it. Oh. Do you, this was not Primark. Oh. This is, uh. so I'm not saying anything about Primark. I'm just saying, uh -huh. the Lord deliver us from this kind of stinginess. Guys, the opposite to generosity is greed. Watch out. That's what Jesus says. Watch out. Watch out. The last thing you can say now, as I was praying and preparing for this thing, I was like, it's true, that greed thing is in me. I have to fight it. The last thing you can say now is, I mean, I'm not a greedy person. Ah, problem. You are not watching out. Amen. Now, second thing is motivation, uh, the motivators for generosity. Now, some people think the way to deal with greed is, let me not have any money. <laughs> You are your own. <laughs> right? Let me become a monk. Or some people is a bit fashionable now. It depends on some kind. Some, within some Christian circles, they take a vow of poverty. You know that sort of vow of poverty? You know, I, just, I don't care about material things. Those people know how to make money, but they don't give it away. But they keep just enough to have a nice house with five, houses, uh, five rooms and all of that. But let's leave that aside. I'm not saying there's no place for it. Maybe there is. Right? But I don't think the Bible will tell you that the way to beat greed is by poverty. In fact, Ephesians 4, we read it last week, and we're going to read it again. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful. Stop. So some people say, oh, the way to stop greed is because the guy didn't have work. So let us now work, and if you work, hard work, any you say, ama, jali, that's the person that does not work will steal. With all due respect to our Yoruba fathers and mothers, that's not really true. D.L. Moody, a former preacher, said, if somebody is stealing nuts and bolts from a railroad track, and you say it's because he's uneducated, if you put the person through school, and he graduates, and you employ him, he will steal the whole train company. <laughs> some people are uneducated thieves, and some people are educated thieves. The only difference is that the uneducated thief is stealing 5K, urgent 2K. <laughs> this other one is stealing $2 million. It's not just working. Work is not what stops greed. Let's keep reading. Doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. The, the opposite of greed, or the way to defeat greed is not poverty, it's through generosity. Because through generosity, you, God wants us to be extravagantly generous. Notice what he says about David. David said, I have given, verse 2, I have given of my resources. I'm like, eh, hey, that's enough now, resources. Resources, yes. But verse 3, he then says, besides my resources, that's my income, besides that, in my devotion to God, the temple of God, I now give my personal treasures of gold. You know what he's saying? He's giving up his wealth. Ah, some people didn't want to catch that. He wasn't just giving up his income. He was giving up what? His wealth. He said, you saw all those savings, all those whatever. It's not just the thing that is coming. God, 
If you are that kind of person, I'm telling you, greed, you will constantly be defeated. Because through generosity, you are, you are saying that God is my source, not my resource, because he's also my security. You're also saying that as a steward, I lose ownership and control over this resource. And as you lose God-like control over it, guess what? It will lose its own control over you. So how can I be motivated to give? Well, let me give you um, three categories of things. Three categories, but nine items. Three categories, nine items. I'm going to rush through them. I'll give you some scriptures, all right? Three categories. You, the way you beat greed is, or the motivators for greed have to do with God, have to do with others, and they have to do with ourselves, all right? God, others, and yourself. Let's start. First one, God. Well, there are two under God. Obedience. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13. Oh, what it says, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. You know what this is? Plain old, God said it, I do it, he's God, I am not. Why should we be generous? God said it. And sometimes we're always, we're getting to be a generation where we say, I need to know the why, I need to know the why. It's not, sometimes, see, you, if you have children, you know, it's not, daddy, why, daddy, because I'm your daddy. Go to your room. You don't always have time. Sometimes we have to remember, because he is our father. He knows more than us. You do it out of obedience. There is the duty aspect of generosity. Amen. Second one, honor. Honor. Proverbs 3 verse 9. You knew this one was coming. Honor the Lord your God with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Now, honor is, as I said last week, it is about discerning, it is about embracing, and it's about celebrating something unique in a person. So when we are honoring the Lord, what are we doing? We are discerning that God is our source, we are embracing that God is our source, and we are celebrating that God is our source. Now, if you just discern, and maybe partly embrace. You know what will happen? You will value God, you will not honor God. And by doing that, you will give, but you will not be generous. You will say there is some usefulness for God, though. You know, in the same way, there's usefulness for having Taiwo as a friend. And in the same way, there's usefulness for doing this certification, this new uh, certification. There's usefulness for joining uh, the, the, the fellows of, of the CFA Institute. There is usefulness. There is also usefulness for God. You see, at that point, you have made God a resource. Not the source above all of those things. And so honor is not just about discerning. It is discerning in a way that fully gets it to the core. And therefore, then you can honor, you can sorry, discern, but you may not embrace because devils believe that there is one God and they are not saved. So you can discern it, but you have not embraced it. You still feel it's the work of your hands. And then there's the aspect of celebrating it. Someone came to work, someone once sent a text and said he wanted to drop his first fruits. In the story, I'm like, eh, hey, you want to? I said, ah, okay, well, this has not been a practice. Come, let us have a conversation about it. And so we had a conversation. I said, why do you want to? Do you feel that you must be compelled to? No, he said, no, this is a vow that I have. With God, I feel that it's something to do. I said, really? He said, yeah, he just wants to honor God like that. I said, no, that. let me pray for him. And he gave. Some of us will go online and start saying, show me where first fruit is in the Bible. The guy is saying, man, and God, we have some person. He, he, there was something overflowing. Amen. At the same time, honor people too. Because when the Bible says honor father and mother, right, he's basically saying, you understand the first authority figures in your life. If you understand the first authority figures in your life, you will understand the ultimate authority figure in your life. And so when he says in 1 Timothy also 5 verse 17, where he says that the elders that are among you that serve well, right, they are worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the teaching and the preaching of the word. Again, it is about embracing, it's, uh, sorry, it's about what? Discerning, embracing, and celebrating. Amen. Now let's go to others quickly. Compassion. First one, compassion. 1 John 3, 17. It says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity or no compassion on them, how can the love of God be in that person? It's very, very plain and simple. You have 
It didn't say you didn't have. If you don't have, pray. But it says you have. Generosity always moves towards suffering. It moves, it is moved by suffering and it moves towards suffering. Amen. It says you have, you saw, and you said, brother, let me pray for you. Now go and solve that problem. It says, check whether you're a Christian. I didn't say it. That's what Apostle John said. So compassion moves us to generosity. Here's another one. Blessing. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 14. It says, at this present time, your plenty will supply what they need. That is, Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and was basically saying, see, the guys in Jerusalem, they don't have money, there's famine, all of those things. Can you guys bring money for them? And he now says, can you bless these people? And the Bible is saying, part of what generosity should be about is put a smile on someone's face. Put a smile on someone's face. I met somebody that, 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 uh, that was so generous, bought something monumental for some people. I, I mean, you know when some people do some kinds of generosity that even prayers, the prayers that you, you utter, you never knew was inside you. Do you understand? You start forming, you start forming words. You, you know, you start saying, ah, well, they, I think I said something like uh, that. I think I said, the way you have remembered these people, God will, all, will, will permanently etch your name in the book of remembrance. Something like that. Oh, you're not catching it. Okay, the person wasn't laughing. Right? Put a smile on someone's face. Bless people. Who are the people who are blessed to be what? A blessing. But then, there is also the aspect of a, fourth, a third one on that others is paying forward. Paying forward. Jesus says, freely have you received, freely what? Give. You received. Now, he didn't say freely have you received, freely give back. He said, freely have you received, freely what? Give. That is, you pay for what? This is when you receive something that does not require you to pay back to the person that you are giving. So what do you do? You pay for what? As a church, sometimes we pray for people who have blessed us, churches who have blessed us. Here's what those churches are not saying. In fact, we even got into one program one time. It was called the something CRF. I don't know what it is. Something, continue something. Okay, I don't remember. But it, it really blessed us. Now, here was what this thing did for us. Those churches are not saying we want the money back, city church. But what they are saying, though, is we receive from some. We are now blessing you. So city church, what are we meant to do? Bless others. We look for other churches, other church planters who we can partner with and say, we take, and we're not asking them to give us back. We are saying pay for it. That's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, the thing that you have learned from me, Paul, right, among many witnesses, that Timothy learned, did he say, come back and teach me, Paul? He said, the thing you've learned from me, commit to faithful men that will teach others as well. Do you see how it is going forward? Now, there's one that ties all of these three together under the others, which is, Elijah, I'm not ready, uh, which is, <laughs> which is kingdom advancement, Philippians 4.15. Paul is going to Macedonia. It was, he said that when he left Macedonia and he wanted to go to other regions to preach, and he said, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the, matter, in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. That is, listen, the ultimate compassion is what Paul says when he says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we beg men to repent. There's one thing to be suffering in this world, but he knows also that there's eternal suffering awaiting those who don't receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. But also, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that we read last week, he said Jesus Christ became a curse for us so that the blessing of Abraham may come upon us. The blessing of Abraham ultimately is that we are eternally saved. So now you have the ultimate compassion. You have the ultimate blessing. But also, he then says this. John says that Jesus said, As the Father sent me to you, so I am now sending you to others. Taking the gospel, advancing the kingdom is the ultimate compassion. It is the ultimate blessing. It is the ultimate pain forward. Are you seeing it? But what about yourself? What are the things that motivate you? First one, discipline. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 5. Am I right? Yeah. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangement for the generous gift you had. You had what? Oh, it's not there. You had promised. 
He says, then it will be ready as a generous gift. Did you hear that? Paul sent, so this is what happened. The Corinthian church, and I want to speak to some people here. When you promise and you make a pledge, the Corinthian church made a pledge. And they were meant to give to a church. And so Paul says, we are coming. And I'm coming with some people. I don't want you to fall my hand. Literally, that's what he said. I don't want you to fall my hand. He said, it will not be good if I come and then he's not ready. So I'm sending some people in advance so that you guys will prepare it so that you will finish what you started, what you had what promised. Let me tell you, if you make pledges and you don't have a plan, a disciplined plan to fulfill that pledge, you won't make the pledge. So what happens when we are generous, especially when we are committed to long-term generosity, it helps us to become disciplined people. Amen. We should be disciplined at time. We should be disciplined with our words, but we should also be disciplined with our money. And one of the ways that happens is by generosity. Penultimate one is joy. Penultimate one is joy. Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. If you are the kind of person that gives regularly, you will know. You will know. And I'm not just talking about, from a Christian perspective, secular people have done research. One book I read a few years ago is called I Like Giving. And this is, I'm not even sure whether the person is a Christian. I just, he just put stories upon stories. Of, he started a website, the website blew, and eventually he wrote, a story, uh, write, wrote stories about the joy that people get in giving. How many people have given here? And you know that the joy that the person was experiencing was not up to the joy that you have. I know, I've experienced it. There is a joy, an internal joy that you get from giving. Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. Make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Now, there's one final one. Don't put it up yet. There's one final one that I should mention that has to do with ourselves, right? This is not, I've given you eight others to show you that this is not the only one. Are we following? I've given you eight others to show that this is not the only one. But I want to talk about this one in particular. When it comes to ourselves, there is one other reason that we give, though, one other benefit of giving. You know what it is? Prosperity. And the room just went very cold. Prosperity. Somebody say prosperity. prosperity. So with that, I do want to address, there's an elephant that has been in the room for the last three Sundays. It's been growing fatter and fatter and fatter. And so I want to just identify that elephant somewhere here. And the elephant, we're going to talk about it briefly, is called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel. Since I'm talking about prosperity. What is the prosperity gospel? In the worst form, and I'm overgeneralizing, but the prosperity gospel is a teaching that says, when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we are guaranteed salvation eternally, but we are also guaranteed material wealth in this life. And part of the ways you get that material wealth is by giving, part of the ways you get it is by giving to church ministries or to certain men, to, to men and women of God. How many of us have sort of heard this teaching before? Now, some of us came to City Church because you are tired of the prosperity gospel, amen? You did not hear the prosperity gospel here. You are so happy. You are like the absence of the prosperity gospel is so palpable. You heard the pure gospel here. Amen. <laughs> but like in the last two Sundays, you are like, hey, is this my church? This, I don't know what's going on. When you first even heard this series of money, you are like, ah. Okay, but I know what's going to happen. We're going to come against all this prosperity gospel nonsense. And it has ah, wealth creation. Ah, is it the church? And now Pastor Femi is saying prosperity. So you're like, are we going to start hearing the, um, prosperity gospel light here? <laughs> well, I have news for you. You still will not hear it here. 
I didn't like the prosperity gospel before. I still don't like the prosperity gospel now. And I'll tell you four reasons why. In its worst forms, it twists the gospel and encourages the thing that it seeks to actually defeat. It actually encourages greed, not generosity. I told you about those who give and that you can give and not be generous. It also presents a low-grade view of God. It presents a God that can be controlled. He's like a cosmic ATM machine. You put in your card, you punch it, and God just gives you. He's like, a, he's like a genie in a bottle. Just rub him and he'll just give you. God is not in control. Third, it doesn't properly prepare you for suffering in life. Joseph was in Potiphar's house as a slave, and Joseph was a prosperous man because God was with him. Life hits, and life hits economically. And if all you have is this, that, my salvation also gets me wealth. If you are sure that your faith is what got you your salvation, but your faith is meant to give you riches as well. If you don't have money, all of a sudden you are not just questioning, any you are questioning the faith that you have, you are questioning the salvation you have. Do you understand me? And then lastly, the prosperity gospel guarantees what the Bible doesn't. The word is guarantees. And that's the biggest problem I have with it. It, is, it gives you a sure banker guarantee. And so that's why you will not hear it here. Amen. Amen. But. Someone touch your neighbor and say, but. but. <laughs> we have to understand it better. And the people like call anti-prosperity gospel people need to change. You will not hear prosperity gospel here. This church will never be a prosperity gospel church. But I want to also tell you, this church will never be an anti-prosperity gospel church. Never. A plague on both their houses. Why did the prosperity gospel come up? The prosperity gospel came as a result. It filled a void. It filled a void in Christianity at the time in all different parts of the world. What was the void that it filled? It came against what we can call a Gnostic, a Gnostic-like gospel. What is Gnosticism? It's an ancient heresy that said the abstract things are better than the material things. The things that we can't see are better than the things that we can see. The things that we can see are inconsequential. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? I am a spirit living in a body. That is a form of Gnosticism. Because God, does, God created you what? Spirit and body. It's not spirit that is put in a body. That is why you are baptized in the spirit, but you are also baptized in water. Are you following me? That is why your spirit is resurrected and God has said, I will raise the body up on the last day. God did not just create spirits. God created matter. God does not just dwell in a place that we can't see. The God is spirit. God took on a body and came into this world. Are we following? God cares about all that he has created. So the prosperity gospel was coming against a teaching that was basically saying that God cares about your soul, but he doesn't care about your material or your physical well-being. That's why it was the health and wealth gospel. Because what we're saying, God is only about Healing our souls, but he has nothing to do with the body. And like, did you read? Did you read Jesus at all? Did you read the stories about Jesus at all? So it was coming against that kind of thing. It was coming against a, a, a teaching that was basically saying that God doesn't care about the material. And so here you had, and notice the prosperity gospel came out of mainly places. Uh, people who were not well to do. Do you know why? Because it is a very hard sell to people who are poor to say that there is this God that can do all things. I have a God that can do all things. Uh, but when it comes to your money, you say, don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. It's in the buy and buy. We have riches in that. And the guy is like, oh, that's why some poor people, wrongly, wrongly, because they don't understand, but they say, the hell that is awaiting me, who cares about that? I'm suffering hell here now because of poverty. Are you following me? And there's something else that is more insidious about this. For anti-prosperity people, I'm talking to you. Imagine some of us go to a restaurant, a fine restaurant. You look at the meal, 
And, um, and, and when I say some of us, that good Christian people like us, right? We look at the meal, and it's like, okay, 12,000 for their filet mignon. I'm not quite sure I want that. Um, yeah, this is their mash with um, courgette here, and the, the uh, orange jus. Uh, no, just, um, you know, and what kind of wine, what kind of wine do you have? And, uh, you know, so you end up, two of us, we end up spending 83,000. Um, and the waiter is there. And that waiter has never tasted any of that food before. You go to church, he goes to church. And as you're doing all of those things, when you see him and the guy is doing his prayers, blessing, 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 you say, my friend, no, you can, that, that's not what God is like. Don't turn God into an ATM machine. Your guy is saying, I want to eat that food that I've been serving you to. Me too, I want. And it's only God that can give me. And you say, no, no, no. Condescension. And the worst thing is this, I have, because I have almost all my life, is, is, the, is the people that I have money that I've spent my life with, and I have always been an, I used to be an anti-prosperity person. I have seen people who spend their lives trying to criticize prosperity people. When they lose their job, you find that they are more prosperity than the anti-prosperity, uh, than prosperity people. It's not that they start praying those prayers. It is the level of anxiety that hits them, that lets you see that money is actually their God. I have seen how some people, because of their level of education, they start worrying that I can't, this person is not offering job to me. My cousin is not doing this one. I've written for the blah, blah. And actually, they literally say something like, what's even the purpose of serving God? I have seen somebody that is an anti-prosperity person that said that. To which I wanted to say, but you can't say it when it is. You know, when you are, I don't want to be like Job's friends. It means you're comfortable. But you want to say, ah, Oga, you sound like, Let's be honest with ourselves. Money is not inconsequential. As an anti-prosperity person, here's another thing. Most anti-prosperity people will try to tell you, the prosperity people are twisting scriptures. They don't care about the Bible. To be honest, to be honest yes, it's true. Prosperity people do twist scriptures. I've seen it many times. Right? They've, I've seen it. But I'm here to tell somebody, it is not everything on prosperity that, every, that a prosperity preacher has said that is wrong. It's not true. A lot of what prosperity preachers have said on prosperity is in the Bible. And it is not everything that every anti-prosperity preacher has said on prosperity that is right. Let me tell you, let me tell you, can I share a secret with you? Can I share a secret with you? Because it's a secret I got delivered from. In a, an overzealous bid to show, hey, may God deliver so, somebody is going to get free here today. You can be so anti-something that you forget how to be pro-something. In an overzealous bid to always show that anti-prosperity people are wrong on a particular thing, some of us have taken scriptures that, oh, her, plain, it is saying what it's saying, and we say it's not saying that. And that is going to end here today for some people. Uh, we, no, it's not just amen, we're going to do it practically. I'm going to read five scriptures for us, and you will tell me exactly what they're saying. And let me just tell you, before you do it, I have read them. In all contexts, with all the biblical, theological context, with the grammatical context, with the historical context, I've read all of them. I want you to come and show me saying something. Oh yeah, let's start. Psalm 112. <laughs> Psalm 112 verse 5. And this is within the context of money and whatever. Good will come to those who are generous. And what? What will come to them? Let me show you some of the good. Go to the next one. Proverbs chapter uh, 11 verse 24. One person gives freely... Yet what? Gains even more. Another one withholds unduly but comes to poverty. And it tells you how. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Verse 26. And this is how it happens. People curse one who hoards grain. Do you see how they came to poverty? It curses. That's how. You are withholding, you are withholding the person. And it's saying that God honors some of that. Whereas, listen, for the people who are generous, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. Are you following what I'm saying? Do you know the kind, when people are generous, there are people that constantly are generous like this. I, I, I pray for everybody, but there are some people, I take their own and I pray again. They will continue to be generous. It's not me that is saying, who am I? Is it not the Bible I'm reading? Ah, it is, we have not finished. All right, keep going on. Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your bonds will be filled 
to overflowing, and your vat will brim over with new wine. Here's what an anti-prosperity person will say. Eh, but, 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 but am I, am I dealing with vats and bands? And do you see? In other parts of scripture, we will say, this is what the Bible says. Get the principle out of it. Apply it. But when it now comes to this one, we now say, no, but that's not what he's saying. Some other people will then say, it is Old Testament, and we are now in the New Testament. And that is the laziest form of biblical interpretation principle you can have. It's Old Testament, New Testament. So everything the Old Testament says about raising your children, we should forget it. Everything the Old Testament says about God is one, we should forget it. God will fill your vats. It will overflow. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Honor him. And you'll see what will happen. It will, it will brim over with new wine. Whatever picture of new wine is coming to your face, let it just come. The, God will translate it for you. But you say it's Old Testament. Okay, if it's Old Testament, let's go to the New Testament. I have received Philippians uh, 4, 18 to 19. Paul is talking about money here. You will see context. I have received full payment... And have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus gifts you sent. You see, Epaphroditus was bringing goodwill from the people. Eh? It was a goodwill. <laughs> payment, payment. They are not a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And I say this to somebody. My God, because of the generosity you have shown, I'm, I'm praying for somebody now. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To which we all say what? Amen. Paul, New Testament. One more. Paul again. This one is my favorite one. The King Fei showed it yesterday, but I want to say it again. He says, and do now, just know this. Paul is reflecting on Psalm 112. That's my second favorite psalm. Go and read it about a blessed man. Here's what he says. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work because of the generosity that they displayed. He's saying this. He said, I want you to continue to be generous so that God will continue. If you are going to be generous, God will continue to allow that river to flow through you. Verse 11. You will be what? In every... So that you can be what? On every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. Listen, there is a secret I've seen. I, I have seen... And I, we must bring down this secret. It is no longer a secret. There are people that I know have become extremely wealthy. When I say extremely wealthy, stupidly wealthy. And the this, this part of the source of their wealth is really that they give. They give. Remember I said that, think about the, the blessings of God in, in some sense in wealth. Think about the blessings of God as a river that is flowing. And I said that if you stop that river from flowing, it will what? Dry up or it will what? When that river continues, if you allow that river to flow, what do you think will happen? What do you think will happen? The river will continue. It will not, not just be flowing. It will be getting higher and higher and higher. You say, what will happen to my capacity? God will expand your capacity. May God deliver. Please don't allow anybody to put upon you some false sense of righteousness. We have addressed the issue of the idolatry of money. What the Bible is able to do is what we can do. On the one hand, we either want to pack and be the kind of people that are greedy, or we want to be the people that only talk about the idolatry of money. The Bible says that the love of money can be an idol. Watch out for it. And the Bible also says that God is willing and able to bless us if we are generous people, because it is through generosity that we deal with the idol of money. Am I talking to somebody here? If I am, then... If you have committed yourself to, to the willingness to give wholeheartedly, I pray that the Lord will return for you all the things that you have given and much more in the name of Jesus. May the Lord cause a, an unusual, an unusual blessing to rest upon your head so that you can be generous at all times and in all ways. You will be generous in terms of what you have decided to give, but you will be generous in terms of your spontaneity as well because God is causing his river to flow through you. I must rush to the end now on my final point because someone will say, I've heard and honestly, I do want to. I am scared. I am scared because at various times in my life, I have decided to address this issue of greed, to address this issue 
of generosity, but even though your motivation, the motivators you are giving me, are, they are fine. I still feel like I, have, I lack the power, the strength to take this on to the end. Can you help me? I can't help you, but God can help you and God will help you. Somebody is not going to leave this door out with the great problem that you came in today. Turn to your neighbor and say, more love, more power. Listen, our power problem is first a love problem. Our power problem is first a love problem. There are two kinds of people when it comes to power. There are those who, pursue, who have the love of power and there are those who pursue the power of love. Are you following? The love of power and the power of love. Here is the irony of life. The irony of life is that those who have a love of power end up becoming powerless. And those who pursue or have a pursue the power of love end up becoming powerful. I will summarize it in another way. More power, less power. More love, more power. Turn to your left neighbor and say, more power, less power. Turn to the right one and say, more love, more power. It is the difference between a man who wants to get his wife to do what he wants her to do and he's always shouting, trying to dominate. Can you not see that I'm the man of this house? Can you not see I'm the lord of his house? He's stomping the foot. Occasionally she says, okay, but she, he has not won her heart. And it is the difference between that man and the man who continues to woo his wife. He continues to love his wife. So that when he asks her, can you jump? She'll say, how high should I jump? Are you following? He's a leader that feels that he has to dominate his people to show them that he's boss to get them what, they, what he wants them to do. Or the leader who takes care of his people and as a result of that, he gets their loyalty. The way you get to influence, the way you get power is by showing love. Listen, idols, this is what idols do to us. Idolatry of money is essentially the love of of the power that money gives to you above the love of God. But idols are nothing. They are not true gods. They are actually mute. They are deaf. They can't really have anything. They don't have a source of power on their own. So they need a source of power. What do they do? They come to you. The more you serve an idol, the more it drains power from you. The more you serve the idol of money, the more you are unable to give the money. But God is the source of all power. God himself is love. So when you connect to God through love, you know what you get? You get the power of God. That is how we get the power to give. Amen. More love, more power. The God you serve is going to create you in his image. If you serve the God of money, it is going to keep taking from you, taking from you, and it will recreate you in his image. You will become a taker. But when you serve the God of all love, he doesn't need anything from us. He gives to us. And as he gives to us, he turns us into givers. Let's just rise on our feet and take this song. Sing, oh love, sing more power, oh power, sing it in prayer. More of you in our lives. from the depth of your heart. Ask him to give you his power. Declare your love for him. Declare your love for him above the possessions you have, above the real income you have. Declare your love for him. As a prayer for him to make what you are singing to him a reality in your life. Tell him that it is him that alone that you worship. See the idols of money being smashed. Tell him that it will no longer be a security to you. Listen. Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 says he wants us to have the power 
to comprehend the love of Christ. He wants us to have the power to comprehend the love of Christ. And he's saying, the way you know this power, and the sad thing, I often say, people who limit the experiential part of our knowledge of God, you are lacking something. It's true that the teachings of God, there is the intellectual part. But Paul is saying, I want you to know this love beyond, that surpasses intellectual knowledge. That there is an experiential part of it. I want you to know this love. But what is this love? What is this love he's talking about? It's not just, it's not the love that someone has for his wife or for her husband. It's beyond that. I'll tell you what the love is. I don't want you to love them more than themselves, uh, more than God, and they take from you. They end up making you love them above God. But here's what we see in the person of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 8, verse 9. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become what? Rich. Jesus, Jesus loved you more than he loved wealth. And he became poor because of you. He went to the cross because he loved you more than even the things that he owns. The cattle on the seven hills belong to him. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And yet, even in this world, there was something that he loved more than the world that he created. He loved you. And that's why, for God so loved the world, he gave. And so what Paul is saying that I want you to comprehend is to understand but also to feel this gospel love that is at work in us it is when we embrace this gospel love he starts to turn us from takers to givers we need more of the love of god so that we can get the power of god